Hello, good morning. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar entitled Instant Payments, Catalyst for Growth in the Middle East, being co-hosted by BAPT and Fiserv. I'm pleased to introduce our various esteemed panelists today. We'll start with Andrew Foles, the Director of Global Clearing Solutions Product Management, EMEA at Fiserv. Mehdi Mana, who's CEO of Buna, and Vinyak Prabhu, Vice President, Global Transaction Banking at Mishrek. I'm Samantha Pelosi, Senior Vice President for Payments and Innovation at BAFT, and I'll be facilitating the discussion. We'll be leaving 15 minutes at the end of this conversation for audience questions. I would like to ask our members in the audience to place your questions at, into the chat function at the bottom of your screen. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, you can use the chat function uh, to chat at the bottom of your screen, but put your, your Q&A questions um, uh, your questions in the Q&A box, um, which is separate from the chat screen. Sorry about the confusion. We will have a few polls during the, the panel and um, about three different questions just to get audience participation and to hear more about your experiences. And those will come up on the screen and you uh, just click your answer and um, and it'll come, uh, the computer in the background will synthesize uh, all of the answers and produce a, um, a global answer for all of our participants. So thank you very much again. We'll be leaving 15 minutes at the end of the presentation for your questions and hope to get to all of those. All right, let's see. Why don't we uh, go ahead and um, start our discussion. We'll start with, uh, with Andrew. Um, let me just say, first of all, that obviously instant payments have arrived both globally, regionally, and locally. Um, and let's hear from Andrew at first about uh, about what's going on on the global scene. And at a high level, what he sees is some of the major challenges to adoption of instant payments um, more globally. And then we'll move on to the, the MENA region in particular. Yeah, thank you, Samantha. And uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon to everybody, wherever you may be joining us. Um, so with instant payments, we've seen a real global surge, I think, of uh, instant payment systems um, being planned or, or, or up and running. I mean, we now have probably around about 60 countries, I think, that are now that, that have instant payments or are planning instant payments. If you compare that to um, from about six or seven years ago, which was really just a handful. And some of the volumes are really impressive, I think, that we're seeing globally. Um, India um, has, uh, in 2019, had about 41 million transactions um, across their instant scheme. Uh, China is another one which has seen around about a doubling of their transactions from uh, 2018 to 2019 where they uh, recorded about 38 million transactions across an instant, instant scheme. And we see this as a consequence of the change in our world. Um, we're moving to something which is on demand, always available, there's e-commerce. Uh, and these trends were already there um, before the pandemic, but the pandemic has sort of accelerated these things. We've seen that. Um, through what we've seen um, when we're asking our clients and everything like that. And the, the advantages are that it's the convenience, it's the ease of use. It is a change in our world, which is becoming much more on demand and always available. And um, I think that the major challenges um, we see when we're talking to our clients um, are both internal and external, I think. Um, internal for banks, 
instant really means moving to 24, 7, 365. There is no downtime when you're introducing instant payments into your, into your business. And because customers are getting used to this convenience and the ease of use um, for instant payments, um, banks really have to offer customer centric solutions. That's how we see it. We see that they're using these types of things, these types of instruments, very easy to use, very convenient. And so that is a challenge for, for, for banks. Externally, we see that there are new entrants who are able to capitalize on being always on this 24 7 365 because they really have no legacy that they are having to deal with. So the new fintechs, and also let's not forget big tech as well, they can focus on customer oriented, customer centric user experiences, which customers are able to enjoy and, and take advantage of. And they really, really like that. So I think overall, the challenges re really sort of boil down to, for banks to remain relevant, I think, to their customers with this um, move towards a, an instant system, an instant world where everything is always on. I think that's a really excellent point. And um, so bef before we move on to the MENA region, let's talk to our audience and um, get a poll up on where in the instant payments journey they find their organization. So is it completed? Is it in progress? Are you developing plans or have you not started your planning yet? Um, if you wouldn't mind audience going ahead and um, picking where your organization is and then um, we can see where the audience is today so that we can kind of tailor our, um, our answers to your particular kind of situation if there is a, a majority. Okay. Oh, wow. So that's fantastic. It's good news. There is definitely a majority. 56% are already in progress in their instant payments journey. 20% have completed their journey. Uh, another 20% are developing their plans. And just a few, 4%, haven't started, um, started planning yet. So uh, folks are well on their way uh, to adopting instant um, in their organizations. So let's let's go ahead and move to Medi and Vignac. Um, how are instant payments, would you say, evolving regionally? So across the borders in the Middle East uh, region, and then also domestically, nationally, um, within each of the countries in the region, or if you can generalize across the, the national um, domestic developments. Yeah, thank you, we'll with you Mehdi. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha, for, for the question. Maybe before covering the cross-border dimension, let's start with, uh, with, uh, with the national one. Uh, oh. and, and there are maybe two elements uh, that uh, we, uh, you would like to share. First of all, there are differences from one country to another. Uh, so we see that uh, uh, instant payment solutions are already in place in countries such as uh, uh, Bahrain for some time, also in Jordan. Uh, it has been recently deployed in uh, uh, Saudi Arabia earlier this year. Uh, and it's uh, about to be deployed in uh, other countries, like in uh, Egypt, I think that they are targeting the second half of, of this year, uh, while in other countries, uh, the, the solution is uh, still uh, to be planned uh, uh, and it's still under consideration, like in the UAE, for example, where they are now uh, considering uh, seriously the move to, uh, to instant payment. Uh, but nevertheless, and this is the second thing that I would like to share, that the 
these differences from one country to another, although they uh, exist, uh, they are not that important. So we are speaking about 2021 plus on or minus one or two years, but more or less it's, uh, we see it happening uh, uh, at the same time frame, more or less in uh, the different country of the region. Uh, this is about the national dimension. The, the cross-border uh, uh, aspect uh, is a different challenge, uh, and not only in the region. So uh, instant payment is still a new uh, payment instrument, uh, as highlighted by Andrew uh, and as well. Uh, things are moving much faster and more homogeneously uh, these days, uh, but it's quite recent. Uh, the cross-border dimension of it is not explored yet, or uh, there are no real solution of uh, cross-border instant payment uh, these days, apart maybe the, the, the only exception is, is TIPS in Europe, uh, but there it remains for the time being within the same uh, currency area. Uh, Buna, Buna is, is uh, preparing for that, uh, so uh, the, the, we are uh, ready uh, in operation for the what we call the RTGS service, so the, 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 the normal uh, uh, bank to bank payment and customer payment, uh, but our uh, instant payment solution is, is also available, it's actually technically ready uh, for deployment, uh, we want to uh, uh, make it uh, happen uh, while in ensuring uh, the readiness of the participant as well. So this is why we are monitoring very closely uh, the development in the different countries. We are uh, also discussing with our uh, participant. We are setting up uh, user groups uh, to make sure that uh, the Buna solution, which will indeed be uh, uh, an innovative one uh, in terms of uh, uh, providing a response to uh, the challenge of cross-border payment, uh, will be ready on time, but will also be ready with its participant. Excellent. Vignette, what do you think? First of all, assalamu alaikum. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all. Yes, uh, I totally agree. Uh, the payment landscape in this region is really evolving and is changing very fast. Um, now, if you, uh, as Andrew just mentioned earlier in his discussion, that uh, in the earlier decade, of, we see a handful of countries adopting uh, market infrastructure like instant payment. But towards the end of 2020, we are around 60 odd bank uh, countries offering this instant payment solution, right? So Middle East is not far behind. Uh, there are countries which are offering instant payment solution, but uh, at the same time, uh, now if you consider globally, instant payments are becoming a norm uh, in the sense that uh, they are main, if, I think we let's look into the driver's perspective. What is driving instant payments? Uh, uh, very first, if you see it's technology, advancement of technology, what we have today, that is one of the main factors which is driving it. Then uh, government regulators are driving digitization across board. Uh, and they're trying to ensure a safe, secured, and faster payment ecosystem. They're trying to build on those initiatives. Uh, then uh, you have the, uh, the current pandemic, which has accelerated the uh, digitization drive. Not only uh, every organization is looking to how they can be digitalized and uh, ensure that their ecosystem is much faster. Uh, due to this, customer preferences are changing, right? You see a lot of things happening tech providers coming into forefront like Google Pay, Samsung Pay, uh, uh, you have all those things. QR codes, request to pay, e-commerce, uh, going on a faster pace where the recipient would get uh, on the, at the end, the money faster, right? And obviously in this region, you have high uh, rate of mobile penetration, uh, reach of internet. Now, these are the drivers which are driving the payment ecosystem to a much faster pace. and uh, last week, I just happened to uh, read one of the article which was published in the uh, leading UAE newspaper uh, was that UAE and Saudi will boost the BINA uh, digital economy to 100 billion. Now, in, it seems that in 2020, the size of consumer digital economy was around 40 to 45 billion. And by in another two years, it's going to estimate it to be by 2023, but around 100 billion dollars. Now that's a huge uh, jump, right? Uh, um, and in this region, UAE and Saudi are the main pillars of digital economy. 
and it is estimated that 70% of this uh, total digitization economy would be based on these two countries. Now, going back to the market infrastructure, which Mehdi also touched upon, uh, is in uh, we have this instant payment in Middle East uh, for some time in Bahrain around 2015, where they started with Favri Plus. Uh, then in UAE, we have, uh, we have this instant payment. And in, in fact, last week, uh, you, uh, there was an announcement where the threshold amount would be increased from 10,000 to 25,000. And by end of the year, it's going to be 50,000, right? So the stakeholders are taking note of this and ensuring to build a faster payment ecosystem uh, uh, within this uh, community, right? Uh, so, and that's a, a good step. Uh, uh, considering that uh, today everything is moving digital and with this COVID pandemic, uh, the supply chain got impacted and everybody needs the money faster, right? Uh, that's another thing. And Jordan is another country last year, which came with this uh, real-time payment system. Earlier in February, we have seen Saudi coming in. And as Mehdi mentioned, Egypt also is in the pipeline. So yes, Middle East, uh, it is evolving and not only domestically in the country, but in the region as well. Uh, when I say region, uh, there are ways looking at uh, to ensure that money moves faster across borders. And Buna is one such example, followed by GCC RTGS, which is in a pilot phase at the moment and slowly, I believe they're going live. So these are the corridors uh, and the market infrastructure coming in and driving this for the uh, digital eco uh, instant payment ecosystem. And not to forget, if you recollect uh, Samantha doing our discussion uh, while pu uh, publishing the white paper on enabling faster payment across border, uh, we had discussed upon G20 meet in Saudi Arabia, uh, where there's a roadmap developed in coordination with FSB and CPMI, uh, where the challenges of cross-border faster payments were discussed, a roadmap was laid down, time frame has been laid down. So yes, uh, globally and regionally in this region also, we are say, seeing that instant payment are, is evolving and, and rapidly as well. Yes, that's right. I mean, it's really almost mind boggling to think about just in instant payments what's going on, let alone in payments generally um, across the globe. So thank you for that, uh, for that insight. Um, so we mentioned drivers. Why don't we bring up our next poll uh, while we're while we're talking and um, discuss drivers with our audience, or at least get some feedback from them? So, what is driving your particular organization to adopt instant payments? Is it remaining competitive and retaining your customers, or mandated by your government? or government authorities, regulatory authorities, or rather is it customer expectations? Or finally, is it more included in a wider digital transformation program within your, your organization? If we could get your feedback on that um, as we move on to our next set of questions, that would be fantastic. Um, so while we're waiting for our feedback, oh, here we are. Uh, that was quick. <laughs> um, so actually almost 40% say that they are embracing uh, instant payments to remain competitive and retain their customers. Uh, the next uh, the next kind of a large chunk is about 30% of the, the audience says that it's included in their wider digital transformation program, which I find very interesting because that's exactly uh, what we're going to di discuss next. So, um, so what would you say, gentlemen, um, does the move to 24 instant payments, 24 by seven instant payments mean for financial institutions in the region? So for instance, what's the impact on, on a bank's operations and payments business, their, their back office technology? And then what about also the bank's internal ecosystem? It's not just their customer facing ones. Um, if I could maybe, Mehdi, uh, get you to, to launch that discussion. Yeah, thank you, Samantha. 
maybe a few uh, high level consideration because uh, I think the challenge of uh, 24 seven uh, uh, the resulting uh, uh, absence of downtime, downtime has been as mentioned has been mentioned as uh, uh, one of the challenge. Uh, I would like to add to that uh, one the fact that uh, the adoption of instant payment would require also uh, the move from uh, kind of batch processing uh, to real time processing. And in my view, this is much more impactful uh, in certain aspects uh, than the new down, down, new down time uh, uh, challenge. Uh, many of the processes, many of the solutions that uh, exist in, in, in the bank, uh, core banking system uh, are still batch oriented and uh, moving them to uh, uh, real-time processing to align with the uh, instant dimension uh, is a challenge. It's a challenge which could come with uh, uh, really uh, uh, some some impact and uh, necessary investment that might be a barrier in certain cases. Uh, this is what I heard from uh, from uh, from certain banks. Uh, you you are right that uh, the. The, the challenge are not just at the technology level, so a certain aspect will also be affected. Uh, I take, for example, uh, the area of risk management. So uh, the move to uh, uh, instant payment uh, would uh, make certain risk, uh, I mean, the most obvious one, anything that is connected to credit risk and, uh, uh, and related aspect uh, will be much easier to manage thanks to the uh, instant uh, uh, settlement. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, other uh, risk might become much more visible or much more uh, uh, important in terms of uh, uh, possible impact. And that will re also require uh, uh, changes on the bank side. Uh, the, the, the risk on uh, uh, fraud is uh, uh, it become higher. The risk of uh, 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 all making sure that the compliance processes, the different uh, uh, screenings are done uh, in real time as well. It's uh, uh, also uh, not not obvious to achieve. Uh, so the, the the profiles of the differences will will also change and uh, uh, require certain adaptation uh, on the bank side. Uh, what what is a good news is uh, at least based on my own experience. Uh, uh, of course, it's not easy to generalize, but uh, on average, uh, if I compare my uh, uh, European experience with the experience uh, uh, in the region, uh, uh, again, we cannot generalize, but I, I have the feeling that on, on average, uh, banks in the region are more agile than, uh, than in Europe, for example, or in uh, other regions of the group, uh, maybe because of, of uh, the, the fact that the legacy is less heavy uh, in the region than uh, in, in uh, European countries, for example. Uh, uh, and there is a, a high appetite uh, of adoption of, uh, of new technologies and, uh, and also for, for innovation. So the combination of uh, all these aspects makes me uh, confident that uh, banks in the region will be in the right position uh, to, uh, to face these challenges and to, uh, to develop efficient uh, uh, solutions and efficient offers as well around uh, the development of instant payment. Yes, well, excellent, excellent. Thanks. Um, Vinayak and then I guess Andrew. Yep. Your views on the on uh, on the impact on the financial institutions. See, uh, impact would be across. If you see that it's not specific to region, it will be across financial institution. And to begin with, it would be the legacy system, right? Now legacy system is built over the period of time. It would have a complex architecture built in it. Uh, uh, right, and also uh, for financial institution within, uh, they have their internal and competing priorities to deal with. Right, it's not only uh, one aspect to it. So, and at the same time, it's not impacting financial institution. We need to consider also the corporates, the big multinational corporates as well. For example, uh, they have to enhance their ERP system uh, in order to uh, uh, align with the standards coming in. Right, uh, both financial institution and the corporates uh, had to revisit their internal plans, their internal processes, reconciliation, reporting applications, so that the processes of what they do today, for example, they are connected through the financial institution through host to host connectivity or SWIFT file act, right? The whole file formatting, the acceptance and acknowledgement and all, all needs to be processes needs to be revisited. 
So there is an impact uh, of on the both end, on the financial institution, as well as on the corporate side as well. And within internally, in the, the not only the core banking system or the ERP, the internal processes. Now in the bank side, you will have the uh, compliance system, right? Uh, then you have in reconciliation, the internal processes. All this needs to be aligned and uh, needed to keep up the pace with the changes happening in the payment landscape, uh, which is there. Therefore, as the poll rightly mentioned, I think the majority of 30, 40% said that it is uh, plan, planning, right? Uh, so it is critical for any organization to have a strategic plan in place to see how they can integrate the new initiatives or development taking place in the market in their comprehensive overall digital uh, ecosystem and roadmap. Uh, in this, uh, the technical, architectural, operational, business aspect needs to be considered as part of the integral part of digital transformation in the uh, overall strategy. Now, secondly, apart from the strategic plan is the education, awareness, and uh, engagement within the stakeholders. Uh, in the, uh, to build the ecosystem, which is equally important so that for any new changes, uh, features coming in uh, from uh, customer servicing perspective, from a compliance perspective, all this needs to be factored in. And that dialogue needs to be continuous in order to be uh, see a success and see how uh, benefit they can arrive from this collaboration. Yeah, Samantha, I'll, I'll just jump in here. Uh, all I can do is echo what uh, Mehdi and uh, Vinayak have actually said, which is that um, there are impacts um, across the whole payment chain. Um, what we're seeing in Europe is that uh, there's a preoccupation with how do we do li um, liquidity management, for example, um, when you are constantly on. Um, and as Vinayak has said, um, it's not only financial institutions, it's actually the corporates that uh, will be impacted by this. Um, no longer would you have um, a system whereby you have an end of day um, on a Friday evening and then you pick it up again on Monday morning. Um, it is going to be continual. So that's, that is a challenge that is, should not be underestimated, I think. And it really is, um, you know, part of having a strategy of moving to um, digital, um, your overall strategy, how are you going to manage that? How are you going to move your legacy systems um, to something that can deal with this always on um, uh, environment that we, will, that we will find ourselves in? Yes, excellent. So on that note, um, what do you think as as our polls uh, kind of brought out the last poll, um, where do you think uh, that, Medi? I guess uh, I'll, I'll pose this question to you. Where do you think that the adoption of instant payments fits in with um, kind of a trend domestically, regionally, and globally uh, to modernize the payment system? Yes, there, there, there are many aspects that uh, today are happening at the same time, uh, and to some extent they are interconnected. So um, maybe I put the focus on one of, of uh, one, I mean, uh, two of them, sorry, two of them that uh, uh, indeed they go hand in hand to a large extent. Uh, instant payment, which is our topic, and also the adoption of ISO 2022. Uh, so if you take these two, uh, uh, just these two dimensions, uh, the, 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 they are dependent on one another. So uh, instant payment requires the, the rich format of, of the ISO 2022. And ISO 2022, we see that uh, indeed one of uh, uh, the key drivers or benefits uh, that could result from it is uh, in particular visible in the context of instant payment. Uh, uh, so these two uh, important changes have definitely to be uh, considered uh, uh, in conjunction by, by the banks. Uh, uh, and if you take these two uh, dimensions alone, instant payment and uh, uh, the adoption of uh, 2022, uh, what each one of them opens in terms of perspective 
for additional innovation, for the development of uh, value added services, etc. It's very huge. Uh, and you see that uh, with these two uh, as uh, uh, taken as uh, the foundation, uh, a lot, or if not uh, almost everything, could be uh, connected to these two uh, elements uh, in order to allow the bank to have a, a holistic view uh, when considering uh, or building their modernization plan uh, to for, for, for instant payment for for, for uh, for uh, uh, the adoption of ISO and for other aspects like uh, digitalization in, in general, uh, which will certainly benefit from, from both uh, the instant payment and also the, uh, the rich uh, format and uh, that uh, is allowed by, uh, by the adoption of uh, uh, ISO 2022. 20, uh, the, the other aspect that is uh, dear to my heart and uh, which comes in, in connection to these two uh, regarding uh, your question, Samantha, because you stressed the different difference between the domestic, the regional, and the global one. Uh, uh, my personal view is that uh, this difference is not or will become less and less relevant. Uh, the, the, I, I don't believe anymore in uh, having different approaches uh, uh, for uh, domestic payment, regional payment, and global payment. It's payment. It's payment, uh, and indeed the fact that uh, uh, this uh, new payment instrument, the uh, instant payment, which is being adopted at the same, more or less, again at the same time at the global level, uh, in conjunction with the adoption of ISO, uh, creates that opportunity uh, that banks do not have any more to consider different solutions depending on the scale, whether it is domestic, regional, or uh, or uh, or global, uh, because different approaches means uh, costs, means fragmentation, means costs as well for the banks. Uh, and uh, now the fact that uh, many of these challenges are, and opportunities at the same time are happening at the same time uh, is also creating the additional opportunity for the for the for the banks to think uh, about the payment uh, in 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 global terms. And uh, if you have a global solution, you have by construction also a local solution right, to it. Right, right. So picking up on 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 that, uh, Andrew, what do you see, uh, especially in the area of innovation um, mm. that will arise from this fundamental change in the way that payments are processed? Yeah, um, I mean, clearly, instant provides some clear benefits. I mean, you're looking at speed, convenience, uh, certainty. Uh, and that immediate access to funds. And because you've got these benefits, um, it's going to drive innovation. It's going to create new revenue streams. And I think the focus is going to be on overlay services. So there's already things that are happening, such as you know, mobile phone uh, payments through proxy services, um, access to salaries quicker, um, especially when you're seeing in Europe um, the gig economy whereby uh, people are on uh, what we would call in the UK um, zero contract hours and they want access to their to their salaries. Um, but also you can see other things that are being talked about, such as just-in-time payments for goods and those immediate access to funds. Uh, in Europe, we're seeing request-to-pay initiatives as well. Um, and Although it seems that a lot of these uh, initiatives are focused on consumers, we've already talked about how corporates are going to be interested in this too, because it does provide that certainty. And, and, and I think to, to, to echo what uh, Mehdi is saying, which is that it's important to recognize the role that the ISO 20022 plays in all of this. Nearly all the instant payment systems will be using it. It's the rich data side, which is where more information is being transported in these ISO messages. And those that and that that rich data, that high quality data that you will have in those messages are going to provide those opportunities. Um, and those opportunities are going to have to be grasped by the banks in order to make sure that they can take advantage of these things. 
Yeah, exactly. Um, there really seems to be an incredible synergy uh, between what you can do with the data um, and incorporating that into growth of uh, of this use of the payments um, rails and and uh, iteration and more innovation. Um, so I was also wondering, uh, Vignac, uh, if you could pick up a, a little bit more on um, use cases for uh, instant payments and, and that synergy with ISO and what you foresee um, that this overlay of innovation, um, uh, how that might play out. Yep. So uh, today, uh, you can see instant payment market has built on the ISO 222, right? And tomorrow uh, is no surprise that uh, we'll see the adoption of ISO 222 getting extended for cross-border faster payment as well. So it is a, a global language for financing uh, messages. Uh, in, it is said that ISO 222 is a de facto uh, standard and it has an ability uh, to provide a data in a structured manner in a clear and an accurate way. Uh, it also provides faster processing as well, uh, brings transparency to the transaction, improves the straight through processing and also reconciliation. Now to this, to see this happening, uh, for me, interoperability and harmonization is key for any market, infra market payment infrastructure. This is the key. Uh, because as um, Mehdi just mentioned, and I liked it, he's saying whether it's a local, regional or global, payment is a payment, right? Similarly, it goes to this messaging standard as well. It needs to be uniform across. Uh, further, uh, just pick up from the G20 report where they said data quality is one of the five priority areas uh, which they're working on and as a roadmap uh, to have this uh, cross-border faster payment going on, right? So unless there's a, a lack of standardization will amper speed and instant is all about speed in order to be competitive in this payment landscape speed is the key right uh, so now coming back to your question whether this rich data could bring a value added service or not yes definitely it would uh, take to, to today with the advancement in technology data mining uh, where the financial institution can create the service offering right as andrew mentioned overlay of services uh, with data analytics and artificial intelligence coming in forefront, uh, you can bring innovative solutions on the table to enrich customer experience. Uh, this would improve efficiency and, and also uh, from a compliance perspective, also the payments also would reach faster. Now, uh, from a, how you bundle it is financial institution will come with the innovative ways uh, how they can bring the information faster to the uh, corporates, right? So that the corporates uh, can uh, would get beneficial from this by the developing their own strategy in the sales and marketing efforts and overall strategy. If financial institutions is able to provide this, uh, take the benefit of this instant payment and pass it on to the customer on a real time basis, that's the key. In addition, the FIs can also uh, try and integrate with the corporate ERP system where the corporates are also on the ISO standards, which will improve the operational efficiency. Right, and uh, take from a corporate perspective as, at their end as well, from a, in a liquidity management perspective, from uh, automation, etc. Th their uh, decision making also becomes faster because the messaging format and the receiving of information is standard across the corporate banking ecosystem. Right. Uh, then second, I would uh, uh, look into is adoption of these APIs coming into the picture. Right the financial institution and the third parties now can uh, integrate uh, easily, seamlessly, uh, exchange information of various products and services, pass on the information, unlike the proprietary system where you would struggle to do an exchange information very easily. This is where ISO 222 comes in and provide a consistent way of providing messages across uh, the standards, across the globe, and uh, so that the exchange of information is easier, uh, it's faster, and there's no ambiguity in the financial communication. And that is where from a, now going back to the, uh, coming back from a regulation perspective, 
So for the regulators now would require a lot of data asked to the financial institution. Now with ISO 222, where it said that the data is in a more structured and clear manner, which have all the information of all the parties. Now the FIs will be able much easier to extract all this information, which is an XML based and provide those historical data as and when to the regulators. And it is much cleaner uh, than what we have today, right? So eventually uh, what we see is the business opportunities coming along the way uh, with this overlay of services and which would benefit uh, from this technology and ISO 222 uh, coming into play, which is very critical. And that's where with the larger adoption of this ISO, you will see financial is coming up with innovative solution and enriching the customer experience. Right, um, that's excellent. And, sorry, and, some, yeah, sorry, go sorry, ahead. Sorry, sorry, I, just, I just jump in here because I think it was some important points that uh, Vinay made there um, and Mehdi as well, which is that um, a payment, it, it's almost a mantra in FISA, which is a payment is a payment is a payment. Um, and um, it doesn't matter um, what sort of payment it is, but the, the payment is being processed. And the key thing about that, I think, is that it's, now we're moving into turning the data from a payment into information. So transforming that data into something that can be consumed, something that we've recognized for a while. And you have to remember as a financial institution, as a bank, that um, big tech uh, knows the value of that um, information uh, and are very adept uh, at using it. Um, they're, they're monetizing it. So, so I think there's something there that you need to sort of encourage um, the need to follow their example. Um, so, you know, for sure there are uh, consumer to business type, uh, type applications that we can see and, and, the, and the use cases. But I think that the business to business um, applications will be the tipping point based on this. And I liked Medi's point, which was that actually, as we go into the future, uh, I think that with wider adoption of instant and ISO, that the differences between uh, a domestic and a cross-border payment becomes less. I think that's really important. And, and that comes back to the point, which is a payment is a payment is a payment. Right, right. Um, Mehdi, do you want to have the final uh, final word on uh, the use cases and um, and uh, the payment is a payment? Because I think uh, we're all in vehement agreement that uh, <laughs> that really all aspects of all different types of payments are converging. Plus, the domestic regional is you know it's all turning into global and also the standardization is another major theme um and and really buna is leading the way in the region i believe it in this aspect yeah thank you thank you uh the, the samantha for that uh, yes but again i uh, uh, it's important. Uh, I mean, we did not cover it very explicitly, but it has been mentioned by by Andrew and Vinayak uh, to to some extent already. Uh, what is also important in in this context is the collaboration between the different actors. Uh, so uh, Buna has certainly a role to play, uh, but Buna alone cannot achieve that much. So uh, we need to collaborate with uh, with our participants. Uh, we need collaboration with the central banks. Uh, uh, under the general umbrella of uh, private-public uh, uh, cooperation as well, uh, but all all uh, uh, I mean, different type of actors need to collaborate to make this uh, successful. Uh, we should not forget fintechs as well, I and mean, uh, they have certainly a, a role to play here uh, by enriching the offer of Buna, by enriching the offer uh, offers of of the banks as well. Uh, so what we uh, have to create here is is uh, a kind of productive uh, and uh, innovative ecosystem uh, where different uh, uh, type of organization uh, collaborate uh, in order to uh, bring this uh, uh, innovation and this creativity uh, and make sure that uh, the, the benefits that uh, are expected from uh, instant payment uh, materialize uh, 
uh, to the end customers and to the corporate. It has been mentioned several times that uh, indeed uh, a lot uh, will, will, will be happening at the level of the corporates. All right. Well, we are, we have about uh, 15 minutes until the top of the hour. So let's just do a quick lightning round and wrap up with everyone's thoughts. Uh, just one minute each on near term actions that might be required uh, to further uh, push alone growth and adoption of instant payments in the Middle East. And then, um, and then perhaps maybe what do you see is the end state for the future? Uh, why don't we start with Vinya? Uh, well, uh, as we have uh, you heard in the last few minutes, is the payment landscape obviously in this region is changing. And there's a clear vision from the government, from the regulators uh, to uh, have a digital ecosystem in place, right? And Middle East will see a major transformation in this space, uh, especially on the payment landscape domestically, as well as regionally with Buna and GCC RTGs coming into picture. Uh, on the topic, uh, instant payment catalyst uh, of growth in Middle East, the key is, in according to me, is interoperability, harmonization, and standardization. So uh, uh, interoperability of the market infrastructure and the harmonization and standardization of ISO 222. Uh, across, so in order to bridge the gap and expand globally, in order to integrate with one region, with the another, you need to have that interoperability, you need to have that harmonization, you need to have standardization. And as may may mentioned, yes, Buna is working towards that. Once we have uh, this in place, this platform is there ensuring of, there could be not only domestic, but regionally, as well as globally, there would be a faster cross-border uh, payment ecosystem in place, which would be fast, secure, and uh, uh, safe because the government and the regulators are also pushing for this. What about um, what about you, Mehdi? Yeah, so I, if, uh, I will uh, stress first of all what uh, Vinayak said, that uh, uh, government central banks are doing already a lot uh, to push for this. Uh, uh, the second aspect is that uh, uh, solution exists they exist at national level and uh, uh, I mean, where they are missing, I'm sure that uh, they will be provided very soon. And solution exists also at cross-border level with BUNA. Uh, a key aspect uh, in, in my view, uh, in terms of priority for the next step uh, is the adoption of ISO 2022 by the banks. Uh, uh, this is uh, again, an important challenge. It's, uh, uh, it's a must uh, when it comes to uh, adopting uh, instant payment and uh, uh, also uh, getting its benefits. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, it's a topic that has been uh, too frequently postponed uh, because the calendar is, uh, I mean, relaxed, has been relaxed several times. Uh, and maybe some of the banks are hoping that it will continue to be uh, relaxed again and again. I don't think so. Honestly, I think that it will come much faster than what we think. Uh, uh, the, the, this will be a push coming from outside the region. I mean, instant, uh, ISO 2022 is well advanced in, in, uh, in terms of adoption in, uh, uh, in Europe. Uh, it is also happening in the US. Once it is, it is done in these two regions, uh, there will be no other choice for the, for the rest to follow. So it will come by construction, I think, much faster than what we think, even if the calendar will continue indicating 2023 or 2025, I think uh, banks have to prepare for a much uh, more aggressive time frame. And Andrew, uh, what about you? Yeah, I think um, picking up on the sort of end state, I guess, and uh, a couple of things that Mehdi and Vinayak have, have said, which is that interoperability is, is, is the promise. Uh, and that comes from the adoption of ISO 2022. Um, and I think that when we're talking about interoperability, it's not just the interoperability between market infrastructures, but it's across the whole financial um, supply chain. Um, ISO 2022 is uh, quite a fundamental shift. And even though banks can see, maybe take the view that it's a, a, a mandatory compliance issue, 
actually we're telling our clients and and others that at, this is an opportunity um, this is an opportunity for you to really um, um, adopt this fully as a change for for your business it enables you to be able to um, offer these um, value-added services because of the rich data we talked about um, and so viewing it that way means that it becomes something that you become invested in not just simply I've got to do it um, even though again the difference is that there will be um, across different market structures and different systems ISO 2002 is really a common language it, it is it is a common language that will be used by financial institutions, by corporates, which will allow for that um, uh, understanding across the financial supply chain. So I think that even though um, there may be institutions globally thinking, how can we not do this because it's a big investment and things like this, when you see what's happening in Europe, whereby there has been some delays, it's now we're fully into this migration um, process and banks there are looking to go to ISO 2002 fully. Um, so it becomes less of a, uh, a, an opportunity to sort of delay, but actually you've got to embrace it. So I think that um, that is what um, I would say is looking at that end state and being able to say, how do I embrace it how do i take advantage of it how do i really use this for my benefit and for my my customers benefit in providing those added value services that you can derive from these when will we see this um end state of interoperability that's a different question and probably a discussion for another session Agreed. Okay. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for sharing your views. Um, let's bring up our third and final poll, which is kind of very specific to a uh, Pfizer platform, just to determine if our audience wants uh, further details regarding the enterprise payments platform form provided by Pfizer so that uh, Pfizer can reach out to you if you uh, are interested in learning more. So yes, please contact me for further details or no, I'm not interested at this time. And um, then we will uh, move on actually to the questions we specifically received from our audience. So um, one of our attendees had asked uh, how our panel envisions the integration of all the different types of payment systems locally for cross-border international instant payments versus only the domestic capabilities. So this is kind of a, a really a look into the future and it is quite complicated. It's something that BAPT has been looking at um, as well. What all these different payment systems nationally, uh, and then how do you actually achieve a payment then globally or you know to any other country? Um, how do you see that actually playing out, gentlemen? Uh, maybe I can start with uh, with this one, uh, just to give the assurance that we are working on it. <laughs> uh, so uh, I refer to the Buna Instant Payment uh, Solution. Uh, it's one of the key use cases that we are considering. It's not about offering instant payment to uh, the Buna participant, but also about interconnecting uh, through Buna the different national solutions. And we are in contact with the uh, instant payment uh, operators from the region to, to uh, investigate that, uh, that possibility uh, and to uh, ensure interconnectivity, interoperability between the two networks of the national, the national one and the Buna one. Uh, this is one dimension, uh, but we are also uh, investigating the global one as well. Uh, it's happening these days. Uh, the results will be shared at the occasion of uh, one conference in, in September, uh, but we are uh, currently these days uh, testing uh, interoperability between uh, BUNA and the TIPS system in, in Europe. Uh, so we are doing the interconnection between the two uh, and processing payment with the involvement of certain banks from the region as well. Uh, so we are making it at a real, real dimension to the extent possible. 
uh, and the results are promising. So uh, we, we have managed to interconnect the two platforms to, uh, to exchange payment messages, uh, thanks to the fact that we are uh, both uh, relying on uh, ISO 2022, most likely, uh, and following standard approaches to, uh, to a large extent. Uh, but there is this will uh, from, from BUNA, but also from other uh, operators, again, like national one, regional ones, uh, and all that supported by the work of the G20 and the FSB for the cross-border uh, dimension, which is not just a, a, a theoretical agenda, but uh, there is a lot of work happening in that context uh, to, in which we are involved uh, on the BUNA side. Uh, and uh, indeed, there is a lot of, uh, of goodwill from the different actors and also, once again, from uh, both uh, the public and the private sector to, to make this uh, happening and successful at global level. That's excellent. Do, uh, Andrew or, or Vignac, do you have anything uh, to add? Yeah, I think that there's a lot of uh, a lot going on in this place, space. Uh, we've seen that um, SWIFT itself has been involved in instant cross-border payments. Um, you're seeing connections between different uh, market infrastructures in Asia, um, testing out interoperability. So I think that this is an area to keep an eye on. It's, it's, it's one that is very hot, uh, seems to be uh, very, very um, active. And I think we'll see results in this um, very soon. And, and this will drive further adoption uh, for instant payments. Nvidia? Yeah, uh, what Mehdi and Andrew just added, uh, if you recollect uh, in the thought leadership paper, which we published in March, covers this particular aspect, right? Uh, on enabling of, of cross border, across borders, uh, how fast it can go. It can't be instant. It has to be fast. And in to we talked about uh, various uh, barriers to it. What are the barriers? What is the state of readiness? And what are the recommendations uh, is on the table so that when this infrastructure is built on, on the design phase, the points can be considered, looked into and tabled with so that it becomes easier to take this forward. Definitely agree with you there. There's a, a, a lot of, at least everyone is thinking about um, how this will play out and trying to make uh, the end state realistic. Um, and be making some real steps uh, towards that end state in a more efficient manner by thinking ahead, I think has been um, a real improve improvement on the approach uh, to be much more um, thoughtful about the end state and how do we get there. So thank you for your thoughts as well. Um, so there are a couple of questions that are somewhat um, interrelated uh these two questions in particular um so there it's a clarification uh clarification question well two um one in and i'm not sure who's best positioned to take this one uh perhaps vignette but in the uae has ips been developed by the central bank or by each fi itself and then um which countries have launched the integration with UAE IPS? <laughs> um, just those two pieces of information. I don't, Mehdi or uh, Vignac, you would probably be best positioned to know. Yes, on the first part, uh, uh, it's a central bank uh, immediate payment interface, IPI, is basically the central bank driven. Uh, and uh, uh, basically, uh, integration with UAE IPI, um, I don't think so, it's because it's a domestic system at the moment, and I will leave it to uh, uh, Mehdi to answer this, because obviously, uh, Buna is in the, uh, in the process of uh, offering an instant payment solution across the region, and from that uh, perspective, I would let Mehdi speak on this. Yeah, thank you, Vinayak. Well, with uh, with uh, UAE, we have already the integration for for the uh, normal payment, not yet for the IPS. Uh, 
but for the term and payment just for the reconnection it's really real time huh? so the, the 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 possibility of uh, transferring funds to buna uh, uh, starting from its account in the FTS exists already today and it's real time so it's close to instant i would say uh, the key difference is that it's not uh, available 24 7 uh, these days but uh, uh, when the buna solution will be uh, available uh, in the coming month and also uh, with the new approach that uh, CBUAE is taking for uh, for the for the future offer for instant payment, uh, it's uh, certainly something that we'll be considering with them. Excellent, thank you. And then ver our very last question, um, because we have reached uh, our time limit for the hour, is. Um, there is a concern that the ISO 2022 application will be actually mandated or a standard will be mandated in um, the various jurisdictions in MENA. And um, they had heard from um, a market in part of the EMEA uh, area that is quite expensive for the FIs to implement and therefore everyone may not be quite so happy, so to speak, if it becomes mandatory for the market. Um, I think we may have somewhat uh, addressed this question earlier in just the statement that all of Europe and um, the U.S. and various other jurisdictions are warning well on their way to moving all of their payments, not just instant, but all of their payments over to ISO 2022. Um, and therefore, well, perhaps not mandatory in any of the jurisdictions or many of the jurisdictions in the Middle East, it becomes somewhat mandatory, right? Because if everyone is doing it and everyone is using it and it has this data rich uh, application um, and an overlay that can be used by all the participants um, for innovation, you don't wanna be left behind. So maybe I'll answer that question because I already just did it. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, I, th I think that's, yeah, that's a good point you've made, Samantha. <laughs> that would like, uh, you would like to add on, <laughs> please feel free. No, 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 I think that was, that was well summed up, I think, which is that uh, it's not mandatory, but if you don't do it, you'll be left behind, so. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the other way of, of saying it is that it's not it will not be a, a, a mand mandated by legislation, but it will be mandated by the business actually. So yeah. the business is moving yeah. that direction. So uh, and uh, there is a rationale behind that. Uh, so everyone has to follow it. Absolutely. Vignac, we'll let you get your your two cents <laughs> in, even if it's just like I agree. <laughs> <laughs> It is, uh, see, uh, at today or tomorrow, you need to be there uh, serving your customers, right, at the end. So in order to serve your customers, your ecosystem is on ISO 222, then at the end, you need to also jump in and say yes, and there. otherwise you lost that business opportunity or lead from the fr uh, front, right? And in order to grab that opportunity, harness that opportunities, you need to take the lead and uh, adapt to it, to the ecosystem. That way. Definitely. And, and 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 lastly, I think choose choose your your partner to help you with it because I think that you do need to have your 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 uh, partnership with uh, people who know what they're doing with ISO twenty o two so. Yeah, I think that's very important and yeah. try to uh, attack it in a very kind of practical and thoughtful way um, yeah. so that you don't get uh, lost in um, the process and, and never be able to kind of emerge with some real benefits. So thank you so much, all of you, uh, for your insights today. Really interesting discussion. I enjoyed it and um, very much appreciated. And for our audience, if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to BAFT and we'll try to get you some answers. But otherwise, um, have a wonderful day and we will be in touch soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank you very much.